Hi, everybody. It's Meg Medina, and I am thrilled to be here um, as part of the Everywhere Book Festival. And in fact, you are everywhere right now. You know where you are? You are sitting with me in my bedroom. <laughs> so I'm he's sitting here uh, in bed surrounded by books and other things for this uh, presentation. And I'm just excited to have you here. Um, for those of you snooping around behind me, those two prints are by John Parra. And it's his artwork. I'm sure you know John's work. I'm just such a huge fan. I feel really lucky to have some of his work in my in my house. The format for today. I thought that what would make sense is that I'll talk for a few minutes and then I got some questions from you guys, so I'll answer those. And then we'll just meander. I have absolutely no script. Anything could happen. So um, I write books, as you know, for kids of all ages. And you, some of you know me as a picture book author mostly, or some of you know me through my YA work, like Yaki Delgado or Burn Baby Burn. And, um, but most people know me, I think, for Merci Suarez Changes Gears, which is out in paperback. Um, it was out April 7th. So I wanted to talk about changing gears, all of us as a community, um, and what that has looked like for me. And, um, you know, just sort of sharing my thoughts on that. So, man, we have really had to change gears. I think the biggest change for me, um, aside from, you know, the physical changes of how we live our lives and fear and um, just the way we're moving through this really scary time, has just been, um, you know, professionally just the massive change that it's meant to how we how we connect, how we're working, how we are reaching readers, right? I also felt suddenly the surge that everything had to go online, right? And we had to do videos and, you know, live Instagram and produce stuff for teachers and kids, keep the kids calm. Like all of those things just started to feel like they were coming, coming at me. And those of you who know me, I'm not an introvert by any stretch of the imagination, but I I don't super love um, social media only because it's it's very curated, right? It's it's not really who who we are, really, really. Like for that, you need to actually meet me and sit and chat, and you know we get to know each other over a period of time and so on. This is how we're going to communicate for a while, and this is how we're going to connect with readers for a while and with each other for a while, and so. Um, I've, I've felt like, okay, rise to the occasion, stretch. You got to do it. You have to change gears, right? There have been, I think, like some silver linings. One is this, the fact that you find out that you can stretch and do things that you didn't think you could. And then I felt really inspired and continue to feel really inspired by stuff like this, right? That people got together and created, you know, other ways for us to move forward. I love that we've done, like, we've created materials for teachers as a community. I love that we've read to kids. I love that we've tried to calm parents down and teachers, that we've made ourselves available. That, it feels good to be part of a group of people who, who can do that for kids. And for their country, really, right? Uh, when things get hard. And I've also loved how on social media of all places, there's been like an outpouring of support for each other. Not only book things that have been hard, but, you know, personal things that have been hard. I know some of you have people who've been impacted by the virus. That was certainly true for me. And uh, I got a lot of love from from readers and from librarians and from teachers and from friends. And it just reminds you like, that we're in a worthwhile thing, right? That um, this act of creating, that this, this act of, of making books, of caring about children, about caring about other people is really essential. So, you know, that's where I am right now, sort of like... <laughs> 
I don't know, happy and uh, sad about loss, but also looking forward. And I think that's the way that we have to to sort of join hands and decide that we're going to look forward and move forward and always look for ways that we're going to hold each other up. So that's how it's really going for me. Um, so your questions you wanted me to take a look at. Let's see. The first one is um, about perseverance. Tell us about a, the first time that you had to use perseverance through a tough moment. Well, you know, the honest truth is that I was a kid. As a kid, I had to be resilient um, just to move forward. I saw a lot of hard things, um, not only financial things like financial need, but, you know, family difficulties and, um, you know, really difficult lessons to learn about people, about adults, about parents, and so on. I think probably the hardest time of my life was uh, when I was a teenager, um, adolescence. My parents had been uh, divorced since before my birth, and through a very convoluted uh, <laughs> set of circumstances, I ended up living with my father in high school, and I hadn't met him before. I, I actually had met him once when I was four years old, but then hadn't met him all the other years until I was 14. And then I went to live with him uh, and my biological sister, who I knew, and then his his new wife and his six children. Um, what could go wrong? A lot went wrong. Uh, a lot went wrong. It's hard to be a teenager on the best day with the, in the best circumstances. You can imagine that. But um, it made high school just a long, painful journey. Never mind the fact that I had moved to live with him. So I was in Massachusetts in this sort of upper middle class um, group of people that felt completely dissimilar to anything that I knew from Queens. I felt really lost. I hated my family. I hated my circumstances. I hated the kids at high school. I hated myself. It was just, it was gross. I couldn't grow up and get out of there fast enough. Even today, when I think back on it, I like shudder. So isn't it strange, right, that I still write like YA sometimes or I, I delve back into childhood? I think I, you know, I do that. I think I, I say this a lot when I'm, I'm lecturing is that I try to name in my works the things that I couldn't then because they were painful because I was in the middle of it and I couldn't, I didn't have the tools really to process it. But now I can, like looking back. Um. But yeah, I mean, I think I had to tell myself then what I have to tell myself right now, what we all have to tell ourselves right now, which is that all hard things pass. Every storm will pass. Um, and then we move forward. It, it just doesn't feel that way when we're in it, especially not when we're in high school. But it is true. It does pass. If we hang on, you know, we can move forward. So I don't know, grit. It is really essential. Um, okay, your next question. When did I first figure out that language has power? Oh, I could tell you. I was five. My mother took us to see, to Madison Square Garden, to see Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. I was really little. I could, maybe I was not even five. I don't know, but I was little. And we went with a lady who had other children. And my mother really liked this lady. My mother thought this lady was una señora muy fina, a very refined lady. And so we were expected, of course, to be on our best behavior. And that was always a stretch for my sister and me. And I remember the giraffe legs being really tall, just seeing legs. And the smell of popcorn and the clowns, like, all of it, and you know, the scale of Madison Square Garden, anybody who's in New York knows that. It's just enormous, right? And my mother did something or said something to me that I didn't like. And I turned around and I said a word to her that I had heard somebody say. It was a bad word. It was a dirty word um, that I won't repeat here, but it was really ugly word in Spanish. And I remember the look of horror that passed over the woman's face. My mother's friend, she just looked at me like, what came out of that girl's mouth? 
And the, the kids froze. Who knows if they knew what that word meant? I didn't, right? And my mother just looking like she was melting before my very eyes. One word, right? And since then, I think I just, uh, my whole life has just been a lesson in words having power. Because later, right, after, you know, I start to grow up in high school and college, and I figured out that words could help me get out, like what I had experienced, what I was holding in, and put it on a page. And then it it lost some of its demonic qualities, right, inside of me. Like it, it just became evident to me that there was a release to be had, right, if I could put my words on a page. And even now, you know, like when I'm writing, whether it's that people are like annoyed and freaked out over the word ass, right, on a, on a cover, or whether I've written something that like a librarian or a teacher or a kid will say, you know, my grandmother died of Alzheimer's or my husband is, is in the early stages of Alzheimer's. And like, that's all they need to say. And I know that what I wrote connected with them, that I, I made our world a little kinder and a little smaller for us both. So yeah, I think I always knew I kind of started with a potty mouth. I still sort of have a potty mouth. Um, but you know, I work out. Okay, what else? Um, oh, what have I been binge watching? Oh my gosh. Okay, first of all, Javier and I, my husband, now our only words are, should we watch another chapter and that another episode? And it, the answer is always yes. So what am I binge watching? I hadn't watched um, The Good Place. So I'm like on season two and I'm loving it. I'm watching it all the time. What a creative romp. I love it. Um, that cheaty. Mm. I loved, um, I'm, I've watched the first two in episodes and still have to finish up. Um, Octavia Spencer, what is it called? Um, in her, oh, I wrote it down somewhere so that I wouldn't forget. Um, self-made, that's it, sorry. Um, self-made with Octavia Spencer. I have been watching, oh, Hentified on Netflix, which is kind of cool, um, about a Latino family, sort of trying to, three cousins trying to get this restaurant off the ground. What I really liked is that they called them um, culinary school, culinary school. And it was just hilarious to me. And that hooked me right there. You see the potty mouth thing is happening again. But um, yeah, it was just that whole thing. Like that here's this family that's always known how to cook and they run this restaurant that's just like really straightforward. And here's one of them who wants to be this culinary guy. And I don't know, the whole thing, the family, the characters, so far so good. But really what I'm doing is not so much binge TV watching, although I do like TV. I am binge reading like I haven't in years. And I, I am loving it. I have to say, I've read so many good things. So right before the whole world right exploded, I had finished what? I'm reading Show Me a Sign, um, which I reviewed uh, for the New York Times. I love this book. Really interesting about... Um, Martha's Vineyard in um, the 1800s when there was a significant population of deaf, of uh, people who were deaf. And it weaves a lot of history of that time and that place that we don't normally know or talk about. And I, it struck me as a book that was well-researched. Um, I hope it holds up to scrutiny because, of course, I'm not an expert in these things. But um, I thought the writing was terrific. And it is a March debut, of course. And so I hope people will get this one. Um, I read um, Linda Sue Park's um, Prairie Lotus, which I thought also look at history that is, um, you know, through a different lens. I've been reading all kinds of, right now I'm reading Manana Land. Yeah by Prime Munoz Ryan, which I just love, and fantasy, which is terrific. But, you know, I'm, I'm reading all kinds of things. I'm, I've got, like, my Eye on the New Gold Events um, by Lilian Rivera. I'm, I'm a big fan of Brandy Colbert's book, and she has a new middle grade, um, so I'm reading that. Um, Efren Divided by Ernesto um, Cisneros. So 
there's there's just bunches that that I'm reading. Um, probably the one that knocked my socks off the most was Angie um, Cruz's Luminicana. Oh my god, it was it was really fabulous. I think it was I, it won a bunch of things at at ALA, and I'm so sorry that she's not going to get to revel revel in that um, this year because it was really terrific. Um, so I really recommend that one. Sort of adult YA. You know, it's right there on the cusp. I had I had thoughts about that, but that's for another webcast. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm reading these days, just reading like crazy. Um, and then you asked me things in my house that bring me joy. Well, you know what? My garden. Isn't that weird? I grew up in Flushing, Queens. We don't have garden. We have the Queens Botanical Garden, and that's it, right? And cement. So I think in adult life, I had like no green thumb whatsoever. I don't know what I'm doing, but I bought a bunch of books and I, I dig in the dirt and I've learned not to be squeamish about worms. And I, you know, I just love it. I love that things come back and um, every year that they, they decide to move themselves on their own just cause. And I love all my yard art. Like I have the thing for frogs, which I'm going to show you here. Um, I have all kinds of frogs. And sometimes I also have yard things that are um, sort of, uh, uh, they pay homage to to my work, like this this steak, right, with the car from the ASO wants a car. And don't tell him I know, but I happen to know that hiding in my garage right now is a gigantic metal bike sort of sculpture that has planters on the back um, that Javier bought me for uh, Mother's Day but I've already seen it. It's really lovely. I'm going to act very surprised and very grateful when I put it in the yard. I'll post a picture on my website so you can see. So that, that brings me joy. I don't know. It's just pretty stuff. Um, it takes hard work to make it, you know, grow it. It, there's stubbornness, you know, I love when like, I, I want to remove something and it won't go like day lilies. And, um, I love that too, you know, like the stubbornness of some plants to, to succeed no matter what. We need to be like plants. And then finally, the final question, what is coming up for me in 2020? Well, my first book really since winning the Newbery, and I am coming out with a picture book. And this is not the picture book. These are the full F and Gs, right? But that I folded together so you could see it. It's Evelyn Del Rey is moving away. And um, I love that story. It's a story about two little girls having their last play date, two Latina girls. Um, and they're having their last play date before Evelyn moves away. So for years, I have always remembered my very first friend, not my best friend, but the very first girl that I remember being a friend with was a Cuban girl named named Evelyn Guzman. She lived a couple of blocks from me. And so I always have had her, like the cakes her mother used to make us. And, you know, her. she had an aunt who was a really beautiful lady who was a hairdresser. Um, you know, her mother had plastic <laughs> covers on the sofa like my mother did. Um, Dippity-doo, you know, we used to play with her dippity-doo all the time. I don't know. I love that girl. And I always had her in mind. And then I went to a workshop at uh, the Highlights Foundation and Shadra Strickland was there. And she was, uh, I just sat in on one of her workshops and she was talking about how we find stories to tell in picture book. And so she had us do, I think, this sort of rapid exercise where we were um, looking at like common problems of childhood, you know, first days of school, um, you know, death of a parent, like all kinds of things that happen in childhood. And then I thought, well, why don't I superimpose like this problem of childhood, your friends move away or, or we lose friends for lots of different reasons. They go to another class, they move down the block, they like somebody better, right? Um, how can I superimpose this with what I remember of um, beautiful Evelyn Guzman? And so it became... It's uh, Evelyn Del Rey is moving away. And it comes out in Espanol también. It comes out Evelyn Del Rey se muda. And it's translated by Teresa Mlauer, who uh, 
recently passed. For those of you who know Teresa's work, she was an incredible translator and just contributed so much to the Latinx literary community. And I'm really honored that this was one of the last things that she worked on um, before she passed. So I don't know, it's going to feel special in my heart always for that reason too. But I hope you'll pick it up. It comes out in September. Oops, the phone is ringing. I've got to go. Take care.